Uh, usually when we do uh, sessions like this here at the Frontline Club, I like to spend a few minutes with um, the guest. Uh, I met him about 40 seconds ago. We're running slightly late. What airline are we blaming for this? It, it was, uh, there was a customer service challenge between British immigration and Easy Air and... Uh, easy Jet. Easy jet. whatever it is. Yeah. I'm, t I'm trying to wipe it out of my mind. Um, and uh, British immigration won by a nose. Okay, well, we're glad you're here. Um, I am so sorry for keeping you guys waiting. I really am. Listen, everyone here has got an e easy jet story. So. Okay. <laughs> it was you're British on. immigration yeah. that was yeah. to blame. Non EU yeah. line was really, really long. If I had been you, I'd been much better off. Uh, one of the things I like to do when I get together with somebody, you know, before something like this, is to get the introduction right, the title right. The um, uh, We weren't able to do that. so. David, why don't you tell us what you do for the New York Times? Um, I'm a general assignment reporter for culture, and I write a Monday media column for business. I, um, I wander sections. I, I do a lot of Sunday arts and leisure. I do uh, some blogging at Media Decoder, and that'll be picking up very soon. And for four years, I covered the Oscars for um, pretty much full time. So I got in touch with my silly self and that. Uh, the reason we're doing this at this time is I think it's on the 23rd of this month that Page One, which is a documentary that was shot, a sort of a fly on the wall documentary, mm -hmm. uh, was shot, I suppose, through most of 2010 or a big chunk of 2010. Oh, nine mostly. Um, and uh, it, it's an interesting documentary. Uh, I was looking at it again today, and it, uh, it, it, it's, it's with the New York Times through a series of dramas, including some of the economic problems that the newspaper is going through, some of the editorial challenges that it's facing, such as how we deal with the WikiLeaks phenomenon. Um, it was one of those documentaries that looks to me like they were going to park there for a while and then wait for the story to happen and and then go in that direction was my feeling when I was watching it and one of the directions that they went in was to follow this character a David Carr who has lived I think the way you put it was a textured life and uh, somewhat euphemistically so why don't we tell them the, what, what were euphemizing there um, well the New York Times is historically draped in Ivy League talent and <clears throat> well-mannered men and women of a certain sort, and I wouldn't qualify in either of those regards. And uh, I went to a land-grant university in the middle of the country that you couldn't name on a bet. And um, uh, earlier in my career, I took some uh, time off and got deeply involved. Uh, um, in uh, um, substances, I think the technical legal term for what I was up to was crackhead. And, um, and I came back from that and I ended up being the single parent of uh, twin girls and on welfare and just started doing assignments as we all do. And I worked for a football newspaper, a family newspaper, a legal newspaper, and just did one story after another. Um, until I ended up <coughs> running uh, weeklies, like we would call them alternative weeklies in the US. And I liked the job. My last one was at Washington City Paper in, in Washington, DC, and it didn't cover the part of Washington that you always hear about. It covered the city of Washington. So it was in sort of Marion Barry all the time. And at a certain point as an editor, um, well, two things happen. One is all of your best writing happens under somebody else's byline. And so um, being the narcissist and egomaniac that I was, that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't hold the rest of my life. And then I had a broader judgment that given what was happening with the web, that it would be a bad time to be in the business of organizing and manipulating content and a good time to be in the business of being someone who produced it, that it would be better. So I went to work um, 
in a dot com called Inside.com, which was started by Kurt Anderson, who ran Spy Magazine and now works at Radio 360 and writes books. And uh, that was in 2000, and that went kablooey. Um, it was a time very reminiscent of what's going on content wise right now, and we can talk some about that. And so then I went to work at The Atlantic and New York Magazine, and The Atlantic was run by Michael Kelly, so it had a very, uh, Michael has since died, but it had a very sort of national security and international focus. And New York Magazine, the version I worked at, no one read. Um, uh, it, it, it wasn't cool like it is now. Um, and. While I was working there, an editor at the New York Times uh, called me and said, have you ever thought about working at the New York Times? And I said, no, I have not. Um, that's one of humankind's, you know, most excellent creations, and I'm, I'm an avid reader of it, but I really think they need the likes of me to do the job. And when I called my father about it, because I was very excited to tell my dad that at least I had gotten this call. He said, well, you've, you've always said that you wanted to work at the New York Times. And I said, I've never said that in my fucking life. What do you, <laughs> come on. And one thing led to another. I ended up uh, going to work there. And my whole thing was uh, to not screw it up, to not, to not bring shame on the institution. I'd never worked at a daily. I was concerned about the efficacy of my reporting. Historically, as a writer, I had, um, to the extent that I had some success, um, and this is not a false humility, I mean, I came in just twitching and shaking, that to the extent that I had had success, it was by being just a little nastier, a little funnier, a little more brittle in some regard. Um, and that really wasn't the job at the New York Times, and you you get the feeling that, you know, you could tr snap someone's career in half like a dry winter twig if you said the wrong thing. So I found it paralyzing, to be honest. Yeah, but there is some false humility there too, because right now the column that, to which you refer earlier, uh, your media sort of business media business column is right. considered a must-read in media circles. You're an excellent investigative journalist who digs deep on stories as well, and not a lot of columnists also have a very good investigative side. But um, let's talk about the paper and okay. the media side of things. I started doing this media show for Jazeera in 2006 because I thought media were an underreported area. Right. And there wasn't enough of it on television. I, think there, I didn't think there was enough of it in print either. But watching the film, uh, page one, which you, is a pretty good movie, and I think you guys should see it. Yeah. Um, not perfect. No, he, you didn't produce it or anything, so you're not. Yeah, yeah. You, you were just like the guy who ended up I'm carrying I'm like the homeless it. guy that wanders through the middle you're of carrying, it. <laughs> you're not carrying the institution on your back, but the film right, you're right. kind of carrying. Yes. Um, you, you guys have how many people reporting on the media? Because you got, you got Stelter, you got the editor, you have... Um, if you count the editors, uh, 14, uh, four of whom were, ended up a focus in the film, uh, all of them males, which has been pointed out over and over. Um, quite white, too. Huh? Quite white, some of those males. I consider myself as kind of a, like, uh, um, black on the inside. Yeah. <laughs> But when you're, you're, when you're doing the social security thing, that's not the box you tick. Probably anyway, not. But the, Probably what not. I'm trying to get at here is that... The no, it's all doughy white guys who look just like me, to be honest. Okay. And, uh, but the New York Times is really bulk, you know, has bulked up on the coverage of media, which I find interesting. Because, well, because I'm obsessed by it, but I don't think most n news organizations cover the media enough. There's obviously a self-interest problem there. But the New York Times... Pretty good coverage on the media these days. Yeah, I think that has changed. I, li I like walked in here and I thought, well, are they giving away free whiskey or is London so crowded that people are just looking for a chair somewhere to sit? Why would everybody come to two? <laughs> you know, media people are people who write about people who write about people who actually do things. So, I mean, <laughs> I'll do regard, okay? Yeah. But well, same to you, because yeah, that's what you're doing. Yes. Right? Um, so at the time when um, I was, I came in as a media business reporter, and I was covering magazines, and 
they, um, and then I went on to general assignment reporting and culture and wrote about music and film and things that um, uh, I, I really enjoy. And they said, would you like to come and do a media column? This would be 2005, so just the year before uh, you got going. And I said, you know what? The, the sky is always falling in the media. The paradigm is always shifting and nothing ever happens. Yeah. Zero. Nothing ever happens for the last 10 years because at these weeklies I'd cover the media and it's always, you know, the internet is going to change everything and nothing changed, nothing changed, nothing changed. And then I took the job and all hell broke loose and, and the sky just started falling away in great big chunks and really hasn't stopped since. I take credit for all of that. By well, you me. should. But, you know, reading one of your recent columns, you, you, you were talking about the iPad, and you write a lot about technology, and you were you kind of name-dropped in there when you said that Steve Jobs called you personally. If you put him in the lead, you should see what it does for your numbers on the yeah. web. If you, it's like putting a, a, a puppy or, yeah, yeah. you know. It's I just, would have been lucky to get Steve Wozniak to call right, me. You know, right. you get Steve Jobs. Anyway, and you were, you were looking at, you, you, look, you went back and you looked <coughs> at, at the music side of things and uh, you know, the effect that I, the iPod and iTunes revolutionizing the retail <coughs> side of the music business. And you were looking at the iPad in this piece, and I'm wondering whether you think that the iPad can have a similar effect on the news business that those developments had on music, or are we, or are we just talking completely different animals being fed through the same company? No, I think it, I think it is a window, a very, very telling window into the future. Not as it sits, but if you, if you look within the four corners of the iPad, <coughs> um, it, it, it has a flattening effect on content to the, to the degree where, you know, our site and your site don't look that much different. Um, you've got video, we've got video. You've got text, I've got text. We have audio, you have audio. We've got big type, image, little type. When I worked at Inside.com and Michael Hirshhorn, who is uh, now makes a, we, we were all working on these little, it, it was like a cartoon of a dot com, you know, Jelly Bean Max, you know, people with tattoos. And I just, when I got there, I just said, I, I, I must work here. I just, it's, it just looked so cool, you know. And he said, this, this cube on your screen that has big type, little type, in a picture, that's actually your product. And those 800 words that you write underneath it, you can write them, but nobody's going to read them. We're all just, oh, that's the dumbest thing we ever heard. I do think that um, the iPad and, and, and the prism that it presents, if you think of, like, I, we just redid our kitchen and the, the television that's going to come behind that, uh, um, we knocked out a wall, is going to be a web-enabled TV. Well, what is the difference going to be on that web-enabled TV between the letters WSJ, CNN, ABC, Reuters? They're all just going to be icons. On, and so what had been a, a 500 channel universe, I mean, look, look at the Wall Street Journal just announced they're going to be doing six hours of live video every single day. Let's hope it's not the editorial meeting. Right. Um, how many people here pay uh, f for news online? Either uh, the Times website, Times of London, <coughs> Wall Street Journal. Show of hands. How many people pay? Are you encouraged? Are you encouraged by this? Yeah, I would say that's enough. Um, enough. Well, it's an, it, it, it's 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 a start in that in that you have. People that are, um, I, I will say, are at the cultural vanguard that are willing to let us pick their pocket, right? That are want to pay a convenience charge, such that if you or I want to find a story on the FT or the Wall Street Journal, we'll find a way to do it. We're we're crafty souls, but you know, on the fourth or fifth time, it kind of loses its tang, and you just say, you know what? I'm here all the time, and I think. One of, the, uh, uh, one of the insights of the Times model is... is uh, 20 visits for free a month, and then they bill you. 
And plus, people laughed and said, do you know how leaky it is? Do you know how easy it is to get around? Well, that's a feature that's more or less built in, is it creates sampling over and over. And, um, you know, when you get there the 20th time, we just pop up and say, hey, notice you're hanging around a lot. How's about showing us a little sugar? What? <laughs> um, and it's very much a sort of uh, soft pitch. And, you know, we're now... We're now over 200000 with it, which is not going to change things, but it's real money. I think one of the things well, that I think about, Richard, I don't know, is when you have, well, two things. One is, once we get people's digits, that's the expensive transaction. That is to get their credit card number. Once you have that, think of when iTunes is friction-free. It's so easy to spend money, and it's yeah. so easy to bring people along the value chain. That's one thing. But another thing is, is we have to sell against Gawker, sell against Huffington Post. They can replicate our audience, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, not just our content, but our audience. So they can't replicate people who have opted in. And we can, one of the problems you have in journalism, or in news, excuse me, right now, is the absence of scarcity. We, for 150 years, the Times has had Tiffany Upper right, page three. We've sold them that position. They've, you know, we've been together. <clears throat> On the internet, we never run out of such a thing. There's always inventory. Both content and advertising doubles more or less every single year. And with, so there's, there's a problem of a lack of scarcity. When you have opted in people, that's not just, you're not just pulling business out in terms of consumers. You're also creating a new, ad business, sort of the, the magazine concept of wantedness. People paid us for this, so they want us. Plus, we have more, if they're going to Singapore or they get, get to London a lot, we're probably going to end up knowing that about them. We're going to get to questions on the floor eventually. We're going to do about 45 minutes of this and then 45 minutes of you guys. Um, interesting choice of words. When you said you started at, at the New York Times, you said you did not want to bring shame on the institution. You're out there a lot talking about the times because people find you interesting. But your arrival then coincided with, you know, what some people think, well, what I think, frankly, ended up being one of the sorriest chapters in the Times' editorial history. And that was the whole Judith Miller and I would say also Michael Gordon Iraq thing. It's very rare for a newspaper to go out and apologize for its coverage. I guess apology is the wrong word, but say what it did about the whole Iraq I, period. In this film, um, you're doing a couple panels like <coughs> this with more interesting people than me. You get into it with, with, with Marcos Mulitsas uh, on that whole Iraq question, I right. guess also with Michael Wolf. Um, how do you feel fortunate uh, to have been a witness to that? Um, are you a little bummed that, yeah, you arrived as a media columnist just when media was becoming a much more interesting story than most people had realized that it actually was? And, you know, and, and the Times had, had this problem with this big story, and like much of the, the, the American media had post 9 11, but rightly or wrongly, people all over the country, people all over the world expected better of that particular institution. Yeah, I think my perspective was a little warped. One, uh, Jason Blair was one of my best friends at the paper, and so I, I had a ringside seat on what he did, which is make up stories about dead people. In places among, that he not, wasn't even. Yes, and so I thought that was as bad as it gets. And um, we're so consistently critiqued um, on from both the left and the right about what we're up to in terms of our broader coverage, be it of Israel or be it of world conflict, that I didn't really know or understand how important what was going on was, how large and important the mistake was at the time and how long it would take us to dig out. Because when you're in the place, it's like, oh, People are like crows on a wire. They're going to come after us for every, you know, damn thing that we do. Yeah, but that's a line that people in the media use a little bit too often. I know because I've used it myself. You know, when I'm reporting on Israel for ABC years ago, right. and someone from an Israeli lobby group is pounding on me, I'm saying, well, you want to hear what the Palestinians are saying. You know, on that, 
on that. Well, I'm just saying story. it was different than that. It seemed the same, but it was fundamentally different because it was rail. It was par part of the way that rail got built that that our country uh, rode into war, and we did what. Um, I think a good news institution does, which is said, um, uh, we screwed up. The answer to bad journalism is more journalism. And, you know, m my best friend at the paper, Tim Arango, is over in Baghdad right now. And we're one of the few institutions on earth that are there. And we're still doing important good work there. That doesn't... Um, it, it, it excuses nothing. It doesn't really explain anything except to say that we have redoubled um, our efforts to make sure that our relationships with institutional sources uh, don't end up resulting in tendentious coverage that may not be in the interest of the republic or in the interest of our readers. And I think we've been fairly candid in acknowledging that in this instance we fell down as an institution. Well, it's interesting. I think that apology came, I might have been, was it August 2004, maybe August 11th, 2004? I'm really bad on dates, like so that. I can't uh, help you. And that was August 11th. On two, two, they said, this is what we did. We didn't follow up on sources. We were, you know. Then I think it was August 14th, Michael R. Gordon had a story in the front page of the paper <coughs> talking about uh, alleged Iranian uh, weapons, you know, roadside bombs being found. There were, there were the same kind of rules of attribution to these military people in Baghdad. So I was thinking on one hand, here you have the editorial page saying, our bad, need to fix it. But on the front page, which more people read, it was still going on. And I really lose patience with people like you that reach seven years into history and pull up a byline and ignore the work of men and women that have had an origin just sec. Yeah. Over and over that we've stayed, we've done. now. The organization you work for has done important, serious reporting in the region. But in terms of um, what you, pe you and people like you want to do <coughs> is stay in that moment. No, I don't. We screwed up. No, I don't. I don't. Okay. That's, you know, and we put on our air a couple of weeks ago the amazing work that David Barstow did at right. the New York Times on the Pentagon Pundits right. story. You can look at that piece. And we spent five minutes looking at what he did. And he won a Pulitzer for that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know um, so... But that's what it. But a newspaper is just not one voice. It's a you know, it's a million different people fighting for air and fighting for column inches, isn't it? Well, you're asking me to react to a story that appeared seven years ago that's been buried in hundreds and hundreds and perhaps thousands of excellent stories that turned out to be true. So yeah. Okay. Um, another quote that you had from the film. You were saying some stories are beyond the database. Mm-hmm. Um, and despite the economic troubles that the Times was going through that were, that were documented in that film, do you think that the stories that you talk about beyond the database that require the quality and deep journalism are the thing that's going to you know, see papers like the New York Times through and other newspapers around the world? Do you think that's going to be enough? That, do you think there's enough of a hunger, enough curiosity out there um, to see newspapers through the new economic models and all the challenges that they face right now? No. Um, I think they're the problem, not the solution. I think that, they're, that, that, that what tilts the economics of n newspapers like ours into rugged terrain is that these, these stories are extremely expensive, tough to do. We haven't really... We still have 1,100 people that work at our shop. I do think that over time, there is sort of a last man standing possibility in terms of there's this race for sort of global information. And your outfit is in it, AP is in it, Reuters is in it, everybody. And, and what's happened is big guys, big organizations, excuse me, are, um, seem to be stabilizing. Like we're going to pay back this Mexican billionaire early in our capital situation. And the real little guys, be it on the web or community papers, seem to be, but the whole middle 
is gone. And all these great bureaus, people that you probably worked with, that worked for regional uh, uh, papers in Europe, in the US, in Latin America, um, in, in far-flung lands, they're all gone. And so does it place such a premium on this inf information that, um, that we can uh, uh, make a go of it? I think it's a niche. I think people who are interested in global affairs is a niche, but it's sort of a mass niche, and it's an important one that we can make a living off of. But it's going to be a day-to-day, hand-to-hand fight. You talked to the Mexican billionaire um, David refers to is Carlos Slim, mm -hmm. uh, who I guess uh, loaned the New York Times company two hundred fifty million a couple yeah, of years ago. Yeah, usurious rates too. And uh, and. And that got me thinking because I work for Al Jazeera, which is a subsidized, you know, by a, a government um, news outlet. I live in in the UK, where we rely quite heavily on BBC, all of its platforms. I come from Canada, where we had the CBC, and it was the best news service up there. And then there was this whole thing, you know, a lot of people felt that well, any form of subsidy or government subsidy, because we've seen the extreme version of a state-run television in the Middle East or in Africa or what have you, that's not going to deliver you quality news. But the more I look at the, everything fragmenting in media and trying to figure out how we get, end up with decent coverage, and I'm a little bit more oriented to the television side, which is very expensive to do, um, I begin to wonder whether people like Carlos Slim, or whether the future is going to be subsidized media. I mean, Carlos Slim is worth $56 billion or whatever this week. $250 million or whatever the Times is operating, whatever its annual operating losses are, he wouldn't even notice. The Bill Gates Foundation wouldn't even notice if they lost 150 million running CNN or something. And I just wonder, are, are these guys going to have to ride in on, on white horses <coughs> one day and, and just save everybody as, as, as a, a, an act of civic responsibility? I don't think that's why those guys generally do things. Well, they do it for, uh, for influence, presumably. Yeah, so there's that problem. Um, I do think we're going to be in a hybrid age in a variety of media endeavors where um, you end up, uh, you know, pro, pro publica in, 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 in the U.S. is spreading its stories and its investigative might over any number of papers you have. Um, in uh, Texas, this guy Evan Smith started the Texas Tribune to cover the state house because in the United States that's where the money is that's where everything gets spent and he 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 kicked up this site dedicated and all the local papers are just freaked out well now they're all collaborating on these stories and i do think that um over time a variety of models uh, um and it might be the rich guy thing although the rich guy thing doesn't usually work out historically the media organization turns into a cat toy and reflects mm. their agenda. And so I don't, can we think of somebody who enjoys newspapers, drops a lot of money into them at a loss, and it hasn't gone very well? Oh yeah, Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> so there's that. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be that, because that's, that's all he does. You know, I mean, I, I was thinking of somebody who did, did a lot of other things and then just sort of, through some cash and save some jobs and save some journalism. Well, look at Warren Buffett is like one of the smartest, nicest guys around and has a broad sense of civic responsibility and thinks that... Um, wants to get taxed more? Wants, feels he should be taxed more. He owns the Buffalo News. He can't stand it. He hates the newspaper business. Just came off the board of the Washington Post and has more or less said, if you want to make money disappear in a really efficient way, try newspapers, because boy, they can make it disappear. So it's just, and, and I'll tell you something about rich guys, no matter what, they just hate losing money, and yeah. it drives them crazy. So I believe that there has to be, um, like, w w I think that the, the, the journal is headed in a good direction uh, toward being... Uh, Wall, Wall Street Journal. You, Wall Street Journal, excuse me, yes. Uh, I think the New York Times, I mean, the cool thing about uh, Jill Abramson getting his job, I mean... Jill Abramson, new executive editor of the New York Times. Right, and, 
when Bill got the job, it's like, oh, uh, well, we, we got these tin cans dragging behind us, Judith Miller, Jason Blair. Oh, by the way, the building's on fire. We're losing money. Oh, by the way, you know, oh, by the way, by the way. That's not the paper that Jill is getting. Jill and Jill is a really good, decisive newsman. And wherever she wants to take uh, uh, the paper, Bill Keller was something of an accidental editor because you had Hal Raines, um, who was carefully chosen and selected over him, ended up uh, uh, losing his job over Jason Blair, and you ended up with Bill Keller. And yet he sort of pulled it across this Death Valley where our capital structure looked imperiled, where uh, we were starting to get pounded on the web, where it looked like we were going to be, it, and the movie definitely reflects that. You can just see us all sitting there going, you know, I, at one point I say, you know, I keep typing these layoff stories and I'm just wondering at some point am I going to, you know, type my own name. David Carr was laid off to, you know, I was just like, it was relentless over and over and over again. It's not like that anymore, for us at least. Stabilized. Yes. Um, you, you it's a ledge, though. It's not like a new land. I mean, it's, we'll yeah. see. You mentioned ProPublica, which is a very interesting organization. And, and what David was referring to is ProPublica Pro is a publicly funded, uh, I guess, foundation funded organization that believes in investigative journalism, has a staff of eager, relatively young kids. I guess they're, they're also. Plus some great big, like, super talented. Old school guys. <laughs> yeah. To, um, you got to quit with that guy saying talented men and women is what we mean. Yeah. Um, and what they do is they pr pr produce this investigative journalism and they then partner with mainstream media outlets who feel they no longer have the resources to do this kind of journalism. And then people are beavering away on certain kinds of stories. And, and one of the terms in the film that's used, I guess more commonly than I had been aware of, is ProPublica partnering with legacy media companies. Right. That's just a scary term, isn't it? Legacy media? Well, that's what you call CDs, I guess. So that's not a great image, yeah. right? Um, yeah. It sounds like... But you know what? This model of sort of partnership is... Uh, um, I, I, I wrote critically about ProPublica because I think Paul Steiger, the guy that uh, runs it, makes a lot of money, like $500,000, and the person underneath him makes... 350 and I said this is outrageous this, but then I started to see how spreadable their media was and how much good work was when showing say, up. When you say spreadable where it was getting to? Yeah that it was showing up in, yeah. in a lot of places and making a big difference and this <coughs> partnership thing um, you have to think of WikiLeaks which you know is a little more in in the neighborhood. The, he first decided that yeah, Julian just decided that ubiquity of information would drive awareness, right? Yeah, he was wrong on that. And he, then he figured out, no, it's scarcity of information. If you give it to only three or four or five outlets, you harness their journalistic power to give it value added, and you also engage the competitive instincts of the ecosystem, and you get a much bigger bounce. And so whether it's people who have information, have money, our foundations or whatever, we've shown a willingness to sort of bolt ourselves together with people in a way. And you know, that in the movie, our relationship with WikiLeaks it pivots and changes. You know, well, that, that that's their record with just about everybody, and, right. and the people in this town are familiar with that. One thing that I was surprised at is that Susan, Susan Chira, yeah. uh, who was your foreign editor at the time, may still be, right. said at the time of the release of the Baghdad helicopter video. She had never heard of WikiLeaks. I found that hard to believe because they were kind of out there. Well, I know Susan is a really truthful um, person, but I think that there is an institutional reflex of not invented here. We didn't do it, so it must not be important. And I, I think Bill Keller well understood uh, the importance of WikiLeaks and, and, and the information. He certainly did not always um, I agree with them and our engagement with them has been uh, uh, I think an extraordinary one journalistically it has turned turned out not so good for Badly Manning uh, who sit rotting in jail and I again I think it gets to the issue of supply and demand is 
in investigative journalism, uh, uh, and you've done your share, I've done your share, the issue is supply. There's not, there's not a lot of people who are willing to give you confidential information. And on the, WikiLeaks got this huge heave, right? On and, a Lady Gaga disc. Yes. I'm a fan, and you know yeah. she's projected herself into I, the culture in I significant love that ways. Part of the story. Yes, and but they parsed it, pieced it out over time, and I think at the time all of us were like, well, maybe not you, but I said, okay, everything's changed, the jig's up, you know, and it's like, mm, is there going to be another big chunk like that somewhere? Just because there's a black box out on the web somewhere. Um, and you know, several media organizations have done. It. Does it mean people are going to drive up and drop stuff off? I don't know. What do you think about the different approach, say, that the Guardian took with WikiLeaks compared to the New York Times? Because the Guardian, um, the Guardian went out, and eventually they, you know, they they fell out in in in, in a brutal way. Um, but the Guardian basically was quite open about where it got everything, and it included links to WikiLeaks in its coverage and I think someone at the Guardian wrote that the New York Times took this stuff and you know made it clear that it was from WikiLeaks but no links to the site it was almost a little bit like we're in bed with them but you know they, they, they just wanted to keep a little bit more of a distance it seemed with that organization whereas I kind of felt if this is where it's all coming from and it turns out it's allegedly coming from Bradley Manning why not just embrace your source. I think, it's, I think it's a very fair assessment on your part is this evolving sort of now we got the 10-foot pole out, now we're picking his pocket, now John Burns is breaking his nose. Yeah, so um, what he's referring to is John Burns, a uh, very well-known New York Times writer, did a personal profile, I think it was on the Sunday before the Monday, maybe the same day, and, some, right. and, and I know Julian Assange thought it was a hatchet job, but it, it was tough on him. At the same it's a pretty point. mean story pretty mean story and and it seemed like the New York Times was playing a bit of a you know two-sided game there and yeah I'm not gonna go into it a great deal because I like my job and I like yeah. eating and I don't want to like be the person but I think that they're I think our evolving relationship with them and you can see some of it in the film and I think when Bill wrote about him one of the things he said is he he didn't smell very good or you know it's just and so it's like it's like, well, they're, they're just a source, except we sort of partnered with them, and... And one of the biggest sources of all time, you know. I mean, if you want Yeah, to I mean, I'm super proud of the work that the Women and Med did with the information in terms of the amount of redaction it took, the amount of... And what was cool for me as a reader, and believe me, when important stuff goes down in our paper, they, they don't stop things going, wonder what car thinks of this. I mean, they, What's he going to say? They, yeah, yeah. Nice it's, like, it's, yeah. it's like I never, they listen closely to me and go the other way as fast as they can. But generally, as a reader, I would say what was cool about the cables, about all of it is, is none of it really surprised me. And I felt like that it was congruent that the coverage that our folks had done and yes, it brought some clarity and specificity, but there there were no storylines where you went, oh, this is, we've, we've totally been on the, the wrong on the path. Field, yes. yeah. uh, I have one more question, but can we have a show of hands now for questions and we'll get the microphone into the first hand. Um, just it's kind of a weak showing of we've been really boring so far, do you think? They, they always start slow. We're in London. Um, did you, were there any cocktails or anything handed out? Or did you guys just... I don't know the policy on that, but um, <laughs> just one more thing on the WikiLeaks thing. And, and, and Joe Lieberman, not a fan of Julian Assange, uh, and at one stage he was asked, you know, he was calling for the prosecution of WikiLeaks, uh, and, then, and then someone, I think, in the film, or on the news clip in the film, asks Lieberman, uh, well, do you think if WikiLeaks is to be prosecuted that some of these mainstream media outlets who partnered with them should be prosecuted as well. And he said, well, I don't think we should prosecute the New York Times, or I don't think the New York Times is guilty of whatever it was that Assange was, but what was it? He hoped that they had been sort of guilty of, no, he said 
that you had, your paper had been guilty of bad citizenship. Well, he would know, wouldn't he? Yeah. What no, an but, opportunistic but, but I'm just quit. I, I know, but I'm just wondering. Did I say that aloud? I'm sorry. Yeah, we're live streaming here. Um, but you know, I'm just wondering what you thought of of those people who sort of created a sort of dichotomy in their a, a distinction in their thinking between WikiLeaks and said, well, we should treat them this way if they're information terrorists or whatever they are. But the mainstream news guys who were in bed with them, b b be it the Guardian, Der Spiegel, or whoever, uh, we're not thrilled with you, but it's all kind of the same thing, isn't it? Well, the, 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 the gesture of the collaboration is consistent with uh, the best journalism that has occurred throughout <laughs> the ages, so I'd agree with you there. But <coughs> in terms of, we take different routes there. Um, uh, Julian Assange, um, uh, makes, goes to great lengths to say he's not an anarchist, but if you read him, it's clear his, one of his primary missions is to sort of get sand into the machine, the gears of government, and to, you know, uh, he's against statism in general, whereas we collaborate and get information from the state as conveniences us and as we believe it to be true, and then we pivot and come back at them. But we don't, we don't argue that there should be no secrets. And so <coughs> there's, there's a difference in values and the, the collaboration ended up being one of convenience. And <coughs> I don't know about you, but in my business, I've, I've done people that I didn't share values with because they had information that I felt I could verify and, and, and go forward. And you know, how many times as a reporter, you listen to somebody say, you know what, we may have business in common here. And the Venn diagram intersect of interest is the news story that eventually pops out. And you got your agenda, I got my agenda, and I don't believe half of what you say, but the half I can verify I'm going to put in. Uh, and I guess, I guess Assange can claim that he's getting it from both sides, too, because you, you, you might say he's an anarchist. But he did you know, forward stuff to be redacted, so his, if he has anarchist buddies, they would have said, that, well, that's a sellout, because you, ought, you know, gave them an opportunity to redact some material, although not as much as the Pentagon would have. I think he does not get credit for as well as he played it. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about w w whatever ended up in criminal exposure, but in terms of a, 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 a rapid learning curve, in terms of, 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 uh, of gaining leverage over large organizations and, 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 and increasing the bounce of information he had and creating broader understanding, I think it was a, a unbelievable. Kind of seismic. Yeah. Okay, first question, please. And we'd also have hands up for the next question so we can move the mic while David's a answering this question. Go ahead, tell us your name and if you have an affiliation, please. Hi, uh, my name is Isabella Cota. I'm a freelance journalist and blogger. Um, you mentioned earlier the icons that will be displayed in the whole panel that will become part of your kitchen. And you mentioned that they will all be icons, Reuters, CNN, WSJ, etc. And you also mentioned that there's going to be endless amounts of video for the Wall Street Journal online now. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the 24-hour news cycle, sort of past and future, whether you like it, you don't like it, you hate it, and what do you think is going to happen to it, CNN, Fox, all of it? Well, just, just so I know, um, like how many of you guys have worked in or do work in the news business? So most. I think there are implications for us, right? Um, <coughs> We're in this, on, on the one hand, I think one thing that'll happen, I don't know if Richard, it, it, maybe you have a take on this. I think we're gonna go back and look upon this as the golden age of journalism. We have tools that we never had. We can, we can truth tell in, you know, uh, almost when someone tells us something, we can call BS on it. We can crowdsource stuff on Twitter and, you know, ask a question, what should I ask, who knows. And then think of, uh, you know, you mentioned investigative reporting. I've done, you know, one serious story in the past couple of years. But back when I was really doing it, if you couldn't get the person on the phone, that was it, right? But now you can stalk them on Facebook. You can show up on LinkedIn. It's just like, blah, blah, you know, over, <laughs> over and over. You, you, can just, you can just be popping up 
everywhere without doing the knock knock. So great, right? Lovely. This cycle, though, this beast, this 24 hour cycle, like, um, where I'm heading into, we just hired a producer on our media blog, and I've been kind of boycotting it because we haven't been able to get stuff up as quickly as I like. But now, uh, uh, I'm going to start punching in with the blogging again. And, and uh, you know what? I'm 55. I'm tired. I'm really, well, I'm really <laughs> tired, and I, I worry. It's cool that I have 300,000 followers on Twitter. It's kind of sad that maybe I've lost my ability to think long thoughts, and I'm so busy marketing and pimping what I do that what I do is getting smaller and smaller. I did, I, I did the Oscars four months out of the year. I made weekly and sometimes daily videos. I did eight items a day. I reverse published into the newspaper. Um, I continued to do my Monday media column. And uh, you know what? I quit because I was tired. I mean, I have my own issues with Hollywood and that, that, that kind of thing. So it's like file and face plant, file and face plant. And, and, and you, you, uh, everything goes whooshing by so quickly that, that, that you, just, you just wonder, did I just do that? Have I, did I, you know, it's like, what stays? What lands? And the television version of that, I mean, Tom Fenton's here it was spent you know, a long time working for CBS, distinguished overseas correspondent, and it was a whole lot easier to be distinguished when you started over here because um, you, you had one feet a day, and I'm sure your tennis backhand, you know, grew accordingly. And then by the time I get involved in it, total loser, there's like satellites 24-7, a bunch of shows. I'm not even working on a 24, so that's a nightmare. So that's the television version of that. But what I would say, what David just said, Golden age of journalism, I'm not entirely sure, but it's a golden age to be a journalist because we get into this business because we want to learn. You know, we want to learn things, whether it's the story we cover. But we're learning about these new tools. We're learning how to use them. We're falling down on them, you know. People throw Twitter information on television and then I, I, uh, instantly they get a, we got a Twitter feed that says this is going on. You know, that reminds me of that phone, that phone tip we used to get in local news. There's a fire on Bank Street. We didn't put that guy on television. Right. We went to check out if there was a fucking fire. <laughs> you know, but now we're putting the phone tipper on the fire because he's disguised himself with a Twitter feed or something like that. But we're learning about it. And, and I think, you know, I know that I'm lucky to get to cover the sort of radical learning curve and all the little missteps that media organizations are going along the way because they're learning so much about this stuff. Where's the and next question? Just like the yeah. one, thing, one thing I would say is, you, got, you have very traditional hidebound media organizations um, in, uh, sort of back on their heels and fearful, and uh, um, in part because there's all these smaller, more nimble operators operating into verticals and sort of take it. But, it, but it's also like, maybe we should be putting the Twitter guy on just live. And like, I went to my guys and I said, you know what, I want you to put a studio in my basement, I'm gonna make videos every single morning. I'm going to write, produce, edit these videos. He said, sure, let's give that a try. And so they brought out a crew and set up lights. The freaking things looked like hostage videos. They were horrible. <laughs> they were unbelievable. I can do good video, but I need to be like talking with someone and me alone with myself. <laughs> Bad neighborhood. You could also almost smell the dead body. I made them in my basement. They're horrible, but nobody Nobody's, after a while, it's like, wow, maybe we should evolve this concept. But it's like, it's like the idea that you would give it a whirl, that you would try that. Like Tony Scott and I did interstitial videos during the commercials of the Oscars, you know, and, and we cracked wise about what was going on in the Oscars and talked about what was going on. So it would pop up every, every time. It killed. It was wonderful. The nice thing about the web is sort of let's try it. Let's reiterate, and let's shoot dead what's not working. And so, but but uh, uh, from what I see, I mean, you're a lot younger than I, so may maybe it it it, it is. W what is the metric? Is it quality? Is it what you did? Is it is it what we? Is it you know we we did? I got three months to work on this story that's in the newspaper that got people fired. Or is it, that guy is a horse, he can really kick out the copy. 
He does web breaks all day long. He still comes up with the daily. When we need a video, he's right there. Da, da, da. So which, what's going to be the measure going forward is, 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 is quantity or uh, quality, right? Lou Reed did this record. He called it Growing Up in Public. Right. You know, and that's how I felt on television. You know, all these mistakes you make on television, you know, and like, you look at them now and you're just horrified. But now like, it's like television and the web. They're all growing up in public. You know? So everybody's falling down. Where's that next question? It's here. Name, please. Uh, James Thackra, um, uh, you like the phrase absence of scarcity, and I so do I write highbrow novels, and that's pretty scarce. Right. Um, we spotted Assange about five years ago in Index and Censorship, so literary people can see these things early. Uh, your comment refers to the word in a way, and the question I asked him I'd like to ask you and see what you comment on his answer. I said, uh, I said Julian, um, what does your method imply about the written press? And he looked very angry, and he said, the written press, the stenographers of power. Uh, this is an untrue statement. Uh, almost every serious thinker I can think of right at the beginning of the invasions and everything else was telling the truth. They were making prophetic statements. Uh, you're dealing on a level of words. Um, what happens when words are subsumed by mass media? I mean, you're trying to isolate something which is prophetic and true, and uh, you're out there in this huge system that is debunking that. Uh, how do you s preserve that standard? I mean, if you want to work in the Times, it's because you believe in highbrow thinking, too. Well, the Times is a little bit more sort of high-low, and I, I occupy the low more frequently. And I don't, uh, it's I, not true. Well, okay, but um, <coughs> the thing is, is for him to do what he does, he has to think that all we do that we're, that we're little cats in a cupboard, that they open the door, come out, we, we eat kibble out of the government's hands, and then we go back. And, da, da, da. and for, that's got to be his truth, to, to sort of do what he does. And he can't deal with, you know, I could come up with a, a, a bunch of other examples where that's not true. In terms of like whether the institution I work at has an annealing effect on me or I have it on it, the institution will win. Whatever chip that they put into you is deeply embedded in my ass. And like we were talking about doing live TV and people said, well, you, you know, what if somebody just pops off and says something horrible? And I said, you've got us all sort of we know what you can say and, 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 and not say. But what constitutes appropriate discourse in the New York Times from five to 10 years ago, it's breathtaking how different it is. Because what happened is, uh, 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 you know, the web became the daily, dailies became magazines, and the real-time analytics that are built into daily journalism, your average uh, Times of London story, or your Guardian story, or Spiegel, or wh wh whatever, whatever you want is. You, it's not what happened. It's why over and over. And w if if you want to know what happened, all you got to do is boot up, and it's there. And so we have to do a magazine in uh, a real time. One of the things that I sort of have evolved on is. Um, if you come to our page one meeting, uh, um, uh, and they'll let you in if you if you ask nice. It's 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 kind of fun to watch actually, and you have all these learned women and men uh, in a room, and they're talking about what will be the six or seven most important stories in the Western civilization tomorrow. They don't say it like that, but that's really what they're doing is organizing a hierarchy of information. Meanwhile, the web is above them, spinning, pivoting. These stories they're talking about are lighting and morphing. And I used to just think that was so hilarious that they thought they could stop time and that they could that they could put. And you know what? I still get the daily paper because this whooshing thing that you and I were talking about, it's like I get to the end of the day, I sort of knew what happened, but it's like which part of that was important? And that answer of their six or seven s stories on the front page seems as good a choice as me. So the curation, the hierarchy, all those things still has value to me. And I get four newspapers every day on my doorstep. And you know what? I'm as wired as anybody. I mean, I'm very busy on the web all day, so.
Where are we with the microphone? Where is it? Is it? Who is it? This gentleman here? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, David, um, it's contentious because you meant, uh, I could see that there, you, you were you know, there was, there was an issue around talking about Iraq and seven years ago, and although I was it's polite for about two minutes, yeah. and then at a well, certain that's, point I got that's bored. Fine. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of what happened in it with the New York Times, but I mean, right. I can equate it in terms of what happened with The Guardian and the BBC. Right. Now, they're two massive institutions, and they were liberal institutions, but when the point came to hold government to account, those two institutions could not f uh, hold them, uh, they could not push enough that they, they, you know, the, the, the whole terms of what was considered uh, re reporting or not doing the job. Basically, that the government went, uh, went to war, the, those two organizations couldn't hold them to account for whatever the ins and outs. Um, do you not think that the, the big organizations on really, really big issues of war, and we're still in war, so it still affected us in a, in a massive way, what happened then and the reporting, it's not so much that the reporting was out there that many independent organizations were saying that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the it's, it couldn't be said uh, that the information was not out there. What I'm trying to get, the main point is, is, is those bi the big organizations, New York Times, Guardian, etc., cetera, are, are so in the front line, literally, that gov they, they cannot hold government to account. And what's happening with WikiLeaks and with other independent organizations and with Twitter I don't know if you're aware of the super injunction story yeah. and how that broke. I mean, it, was, it, was, it couldn't have been broken by a big organization. It had to be a, a groundswell from underneath. Do you not feel that, that, that it's almost as if that, that we're coming to the, the, the final days of massive organizations which are far too focused so that they cannot really hold governments to account in the way that perhaps they did in the past? Well, two, two parts to that. One is, um, let's look at the Arab Spring. Is, uh, if there's no such thing as Facebook and Twitter, um, would there have been a broad regional leap toward independence? Probably not, but I, how important was Al Jazeera in that? You know what I mean? In terms of, of, of providing visibility and putting a megaphone on a lot of what was going on and curating that Twitter feed, looking at that data stream, pulling out, or uh, in, in the US, uh, 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 Carvin at NPR, you know, uh, again and again, sort of, uh, just, I, I do think that, that the sort of hybrid thing where you say, well, the beast is crumbling to earth and a new sort of crowd source. Nah, I think you're gonna be looking at hybrids and I think the journalistic brands in an age of clutter are more important, not less, but that's just me. The other thing is, is, is people like to say, well, we've, in the US, we've gone to war for 10 years. The buildings, uh, the buildings fell down, and I covered uh, uh, that story, and we went to war to the tune of trillions. You know, many thousands of American men and women's lives, Afghans as well, Iraqis as well. There, there are points in our history when uh, uh, better than uh, 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 half the American people thought that Saddam Hussein knocked down those towers. Okay, okay it's because of the media? No, it's because George Bush and his, his, his dudes again and again sold a version of American greatness that suggested, look, we're gonna go get this guy, lickety split, it'll be done, mission accomplished, over and over. So at what point does this public, which people are, so you know, they're the source of truth telling, they're the source, <coughs> does the public's lack of interest and gullibility and willingness to go along with uh, um, what is on its face, uh, silly government misinformation, um, you can't fight that all with journalism. When you talk about the failures of institutions, I think you ought to put the voting public in there as well. We we put you know some pretty silly people in the office who've said silly things, and people have bought it in the main. And but those West White House press conferences, there were certain newspapers that were invited in, and they 
and they came, but very, you know, you had Donald Rumsfeld, for, for example. If anyone asked the question that steered in any way outside the line of what was acceptable, they would then, they would, you know, I, I was going to say that the White House press conferences, they were very uh, carefully stage managed, that anyone not allowed, anyone who steered clear, they were out. And it's this thing of lack of access, and so the big organizations need that access, so they have to comply to some point. Whereas you know, I, the, the, I the asymmetric... Let me just jump on that for a second. I don't happen to agree with David's right. view. I mean, I happen to think that the media were a big part of this. Mm -hmm. Not just the New York Times, Fox News was much worse. ABC News, my former employer, best of a bad lot, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, even at the time. And I think all of that, and, and I, hap I happen to think that the BBC did a far better job this publicly funded organization here fell short in certain key areas yeah. than what we had, you know, what, what, than what we saw in North America in the big bad private media. You know, and I think that was reflected because I think you had demonstrations in big American cities and they would have maybe 10, 12,000 people out. February 15th, 2003, we had 1.2 million people on the streets of London in a country with no great tradition for public demonstrations. And I think that's because the media here largely did a better job. They didn't do a great job. Guardian wasn't even sure where they wanted to go on that story. Independent was, you know, was, was questioning the, the rationale. But I, I just be careful about the, the absolutism. You know, when you say anybody who's straight outside those questions in, you know, the Pentagon or in the White House, you know, those questions were asked. They just weren't asked often enough. The question might have been asked once or, and it wasn't followed up on. And then that reporter then feels isolated because unless that journalist, unless there's a follow-up, and, you know, so but, so I just be a little bit careful of the absolute yeah, side, even though I, uh, yeah. I disagree fundamentally. We had the White House show up and say, do not, do not publish the fact that we're data mining American citizens and citizens abroad over and over, make a personal appeal to us. We thought it over and said, no, we're going to publish. Yeah, New York Times fought them on that. You know, so. But on the absolute key area of weapons of mass destruction, right about that point, even the BBC had to comply. Yeah, they, eventually they did, but they asked a bunch of questions, and the BBC was at war with its patron government, you know, keep in mind, you know, and who would have thunk that 20 years ago? You know, so, so, it, it, yeah, let's, let's try to move on to the next point. Who we, okay, go ahead, please. Um, hi, um, I was really interested in a point that was made in the film in uh, page one about, um, <coughs> I, apologies if it was your point, I forget who exactly made it, but it was made in the film. That if it was a good one, I certainly made it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the point was made that um, with all these new organizations that are popping up like ProPublica and various other blogs and things like that that form this kind of whooshing media that you were talking about right. um, that seem to be undermining and sort of making these big old uh, news organizations crumble and things like that, like the New York Times and all the other established ones. Um, the point was made that actually if these uh, big organizations crumble enough, actually these blogs and organizations like Republica and people like that won't have the source for their stories. And as you mentioned, in terms of sitting down at the end of the day and thinking what was really important. Um, and I was wondering whether that was a sentiment that you agreed with and where you think that tipping point might come. Well, in the movie, there's a guy who d runs a news aggregation site, and he's arguing in the debate for the end of mainstream media. And so I took a, <coughs> um, I did uh, a screenshot of his website, and I, and uh, uh, Newser, it's called, and I cut out every story from the mainstream media that was in there, and it was like looking through a piece of Swiss cheese. And I think part of what you've got going on is. I always think it's hilarious whenever I'm debating people about it's a pilot fish who's, you know, so much of the content is, 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 is pinging off of uh, mainstream media. It's like, why would a pilot fish root for the death of what it's, what, what it's feeding off of? And when people do that, I always say, you know what, you might have to pick up the phone, make a few actual calls and find out what's going on instead of saying how we got it wrong or, or, you know, putting, you know, so much of what you read on the web is what actually happened and then a little secret sauce on top, a little attitude, a little top spin, and supposedly that's value added. I don't buy that. The killer app on the web, and it's been shown over time, is original news. It is. You know, and just to pick up on one point David made earlier, you know, you mentioned the Arab Spring. One of the 
One of the most interesting people we spoke to in the run-up, and I think this was somewhere between Tunisia and Egypt, is Mark Lynch. He's, uh, he's a blogger, knows the Arab media. And everybody in the media sort of, you know, was intoxicated by the idea, well, oh, this is unprecedented, what's happening out of Tunisia wrong. It wasn't unprecedented. We saw this to a lower, uh, to, a, to a lesser extent in Egypt in 2005. We saw it again in Iran in, was it 08 or 09, where there was this user-generated stuff coming out. And uh, what, what Lynch said, which I happen to believe is true, he says the thing that has changed is the turnaround time and the flexibility that a news organization like Al Jazeera or CNN or any uh, or, or the BBC has in interacting with these new sources. So this video was coming out of Tehran <coughs> whenever that was that summer after the election, I think it was 09, and the mainstream media just, they just, they just, they just hadn't figured out yet how to turn it around quickly, how to contextualize it. And, I mean, I'm not saying this to be a shill for the mainstream media, because that's who still, you know, signs my paycheck. But, yeah, all those, those voices, those videos streaming out of those places, you know, exciting, I incredibly valuable, and ever more important with the shrinking of mainstream media resources and the in inability to get in there because we don't have the bodies or because Mubarak or Gaddafi or somebody has locked us out. But without <coughs> that mainstream media collating and contextualizing role, then people are sitting at home or on their computers trying to figure out what this video means. So it's, it's not an either or. It's, it's, it's a grouping and it's a collaboration these days. We have a question over here? Sorry. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I think you've sort of touched on a lot of what, of what so I was going to say there. Um, the decentralization of what a journalist has traditionally done, particularly with the advent of technology. I mean, you mentioned curating and things like Twitter and that news is no longer something that you have to go and find. I mean, it still has to be found, of course, but you know, a lot of it does come from... Yeah. And it's it much easier now, nowadays to give a stringer a camera and teach them how to you know, put somebody in a third of a shot than it is to send uh, someone who you've tra paid money to train to go out to a country like Libya and do that. So where, how much of a change is there in the role of a journalist and where, is, where does that end? I think the journalist's role, if you're talking about the guy who goes out and does, you know, whether it's the print world or television world, I think when they're doing it, that role hasn't really changed that much except they've got to work harder because there are so many more platforms to hit and, you know, uh, what have you. I think it's, it's the role of the editor that changes. It's the role of the news organizations. It's, it's HQ that's getting all this stuff coming in, you know, and it's, it's, like, it's, it's like a schizophrenic, you know, because they're getting access to all this information that they've never had access to before, and that's where the challenge is. And I think news organizations have got to bulk up in the middle. You know, the people talk about the independent, you know, it's still a daily newspaper, but, you know, they've shrunk their editing staff, and it's nothing compared to the Times of London and what, and what Murdoch is still willing to pay for. But I think, you know, with this stuff coming in, you know, responsible news organizations, or just news organizations who want to keep their sanity, you know, uh, and who need to collate and then provide the context, they're going to have to bulk up in the middle. So somewhere in that middle management editorial function, I think, you know, they're still going to have a little bit of money to send people out the door. That journalist with his camera will be doing the same kind of work that I did a few years ago with a slightly smaller crew. You know, that's kind of the way I see it from the electronic side. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, David. Well, one, one of the things I like about the movie that Andrew made, page one, is the role of editors is clearly visible. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, well, if information is everywhere, what, what value are you really bringing? We had this, in the movie, there's this big debate over NBC. They declared the end of the war, and we're like going back and forth. Yeah. And writers are always, the answer is, well, God, we need to write a story about it. And it's debated uh, for, you know, probably a half a day at our place. What story will we write about? NBC did a story about the war ending and... The, the end war. of combat troops. The, the end of, okay, whatever, yeah. And the editor's answer? Bobkiss, nothing. We will write nothing. Well, that would never be a writer's answer, right? Okay, so there's, the, the, that's, that's to your point. The one thing I worry about is, uh, I, I did a, one of these things for the movie with Gay Talese, who, you know, I was just peeing my pants being on the stage with them. And he said, we are people who go outside. We are people who leave the room and find people more interesting than we are. It's so easy to just get jacked in to the data stream and just be, and so the whole tradition of, 
narrative journalism, which is where I come from, from weeklies and from, um, I worry about my ability to sort of, uh, is that really valued to hit the street, to actually get with people, to, you know, um, um, or is that part going to be a way, a way to where we're all just, we're all, we're all passing around the same set of electrons and putting a little more uh, spin on them and that people aren't, aren't going outside, as Gay Talia said. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you're on the phone. You, you know, I think people will always buy that. It's just like, you know, I have a kid who's trying to figure out whether he wants to go into journalism or not. I watch, I, I see everything fragmenting, fractionalizing, just disintegrating. And I want to say, oh, don't be crazy, you know. Go become a broker. But on the other hand, I, I think that there will always be, you know, people used to sit around fires and listen to stories being told. Then we went and read novels, and then we went and read newspapers, and now we go to websites, and we, but we still want to watch the video. There's always going to be a market for stories well told, whether they're in print, in radio, or in television. That's my optimistic view. We may have time for one more question. Oh, okay. uh, my name's Todd Cardio, I work in business journalism here uh, for a magazine. And my question is pretty much on brands, what you were talking about before, and news organizations. We're going to end this on branding? Yeah, that's surprisingly. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's wow. that cheesy. No, I don't. I'm more interested in, in the Guardian's move back into the States or into New York and also in the Huffington Post coming to the UK and talking about further other markets. And are we going to see more of this attempt to globalise or are we going to try and see, like in local markets, or are we going to try and see a bit more of a, a blending all the way through? I'm, I'm interested to see how far we You're saying go. that the Manchester Guardian is a little too jumped up for its own good. What do you think of that, David? <laughs> Well, if you look at the Guardian coming into the U.S., what 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 did they they picked uh, Nick, who's already a brand, right? Nick Davies. Yeah, who's a brand unto himself. This is the guy who, as most of you know, did the bulk of the uh, phone hacking story. So it's like he already has his his tribe is already riding with them, and uh, Anna Marie Cox, who's, you know, what was the original Wonkette. I thought they did sort of a smart play, and if you talk about what they're coming up with is sort of a slice of a slice, maybe people who are tired of us or who want to add to their diet. Um, I, I think it's uh, uh, smart. I'm interested in how sort of fungible HuffPo is. You know, last time I talked to... Uh, uh, Ariana about this TechCrunch thing. Uh, uh, she's in Brazil. David, don't be ridiculous. Uh, so, and I just said, you, you know, you gotta admire. She went from nothing to a brand that was worth 350 million bucks, with nothing more really than chutzpah and sensibility. We all laughed at her when she got started. I, I'd never seen anything more remarkable in my life, and so. I think you have to know what you're getting with certain titles over and over. And it can be really small ones or really big ones. But if you're a big blob of media right now, if you're Yahoo, if you're AOL, if you were the blob of media instead of like what searches the blob of media, which is a pretty good, um, or you have your own idea, I think you're in trouble. I think it's really important both as a writer and as an organization to have a specific identity in the minds of people. My favorite line on Ariana Huffington came years ago. I think it was in a Guardian weekend profile. Someone described her as the most mo upwardly mobile Greek since Icarus. But uh, Wait, though. Yeah, but. Wait, though. The biggest social climber since Sir Edmund Hillary. Yeah, but. Icarus did not come to a happy ending, you know, but it's worked out well for her, 350 million. She is relentless. Yeah, she is, you know, she's a pit bull, and um, not everybody loves her. I happen to think that Huffington Post isn't going to make the inroads that it, did he that it did here that it did in the United States, and I think that is because I think the, the mainstream media here has at least given the British reading public a sort of spectrum of views, say, in this 10-year period that Huffington Post has grown. Um, you know, you know that what you're getting on the right, you know, from the Times and the Express and the Telegraph all the way through to the left. Uh, it's sort of written on everybody's sleeve, whereas in North America, where I grew up, when the Ottawa citizen landed on our front step, it was just the voice of authority. Uh, Europe, Europe is different, whether it's Liberation and Figaro 
in France. Everyone knows which one's left, which one's right. We're all, they're all very grown up about it. Whereas I think in, the, in North America there was this feeling and this belief that media was always, you know, authoritative and not necessarily ideological, but just, or small I ideological. And I think a lot of people felt left down by that. And that is why the media critiquing blogosphere and the alternative media blogosphere in the United States is far more developed than it is here. <coughs> I think it's just because people felt that there was a need for that. And I think that's one of the reasons that HuffPo grew as sort of the unofficial newspaper of the left. Uh, and I just think there's less of a need for it here. I think there'll be less of a hunger for it here. I think your concept of Europe as a self-cleaning oven is overestimating really what's going on here. And I think she'll surprise you a little bit. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, I'd be happy if she, you know, kept going from strength to strength. I'm not sure. Uh, and you know what? Nobody's fought with her and knocked her down more than, I, I mean, I've been in this death match with Huffington Post uh, of late over TechCrunch, but they... But she's they, not dead yet. But she, I mean, with TechCrunch, the guy who ran their amazing, amazing sort of Silicon Valley site said, I'm going to set up a fund to cover these, to, to invest in these companies that we write about, and I'm going to call it Crunch Fund. So you have a journalistic brand and, 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 and a venture capital brand, and AOL, which bought the thing for $30 million, instead of saying, oh, good idea, you're fired, <laughs> they said, you know what? We want to give you 10 million bucks to be part of the fund. And I was just like, and I don't think Ariana was all that excited about it, but she didn't end up bystanding what was a remarkable fiasco. I want to thank David for being here tonight. I can't believe we went 90 minutes without really getting into the phone hacking thing, but it's probably for the best. Can uh, we just do one little Murdoch thing? I'll go. I, I don't want to say anything, but I want to learn something. You tell me. We're, because my opinion is in the US where I've done some reporting, um, that you, you have this division, News America Marketing, where really bad stuff went on. I have a bunch more about it. But there's no milly moment. There's no moment where it really gains traction in the public consciousness. Whereas in Britain, you've got civil matters, legal matters, governmental matters, still media. So there's going to be this tick, tock, tick, Tact. So I'm here to learn about that. I just, I just want to know what you guys think. Well, is I think you hit it when you said that there was no, that there has been no milli moment because you got to remember, up until how, however many months ago, this was an amazing story that was outrageous on so many levels. Nick Davies was doing amazing work, as, as you know, was Rush Bridger. Uh, they, they could. Uh, we, we had a little story in there. You know, you know, I'll tell you what's interesting about that, just David. You know, because one, one, of the things, one of the things that was interesting is that the Guardian was doing the work that it was doing, and no one was following up here. Right. And a lot of people said that's because Murdoch controls 40% of print right. and maybe scares the other 55% that isn't the Guardian, right? right? And, then, and, and plus, knowing the Brits, I've lived here for a few years the way I do, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, because it's so ideological here and everyone knows that the Guardian's coming from the left, they were saying, eh, Murdoch was up to some stuff, but it's, it's just the Guardian. It's just the Guardian. You know, or it's just the culture of the British press right. in general. It, it's, it's the culture of the British press, and we've let them get away with it, and they're naughty, naughty boys, but it's just the Guardian saying this. Mm -hmm. And what was weird was when the New York Times published a piece in the magazine and put two Pulitzer Prize winning journalists on it and a, a, a three-person team, they worked it for months, they did a big piece in, in the Times magazine, you put the A-team on it, and the reason was, well, I mean, Perhaps part of the motivation was you guys are in a death match with the Wall Street Journal, which is a Murdoch paper. Anyway, and the way the British That's bullshit. Well, but go, no, go no, ahead. okay, maybe it's not a death match, but he's out to get you. Is it no, he wants to kill us. But if you think right. we're okay, using, okay, okay. just a second, no, no, just, no, just stop. Let me, no, let me finish this, and then. Oh, so we assigned no, three no, reporters no, to take no, him no, down. It's just, just. I didn't just say it. You finish. did. Okay, let me finish and then knock it down. Okay, but I'm making the point because of how the British audience saw it that the British audience didn't take into account that maybe the New York Times had an issue with Murdoch because Murdoch had an issue with the New York Times. And so they read that New York Times piece and they, they all said, oh, this must be serious because the New York Times is actually interest interested. And they read that correctly. If you think we use those reporters for a purpose punch, you're, you're really wrong. Okay, well, how often do you put two Pulitzer Prize winning reporters on a story for the magazine on another news organization and a story that is based in the United Kingdom that, that America has no strategic interest in. We project journalistic might all over this world in terms of 
in terms of wherever a good no, story no, lies. David. You know what? Okay, you can say you can say, you know, it's like it's like Bill Keller sat down and said, Bring me the head of Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> Bring me the bloody head. I want it in a basket. It that's not the way it went down. It was a super important story, and our coverage, I think, ended up being predictive. Why did it take you three years to get to the story? And when well, the rest of the British press sat on their hands and did nothing. Yeah, but it, it was a British story. So they're the ones who... About a global media concern. Yeah. But you guys... So we were, we were either late or overly aggressive. We can't be both. No. My point is that you guys only went at that story with the big guns after Murdoch went after the Wall Street Journal, when he uh, went, at, went after the New York Times by ch shaping the journal in a way that was clearly aiming at trying to get at the New York Times. You don't think that's fair to say? You and your tinfoil helmet can work that out and, and have a long conversation about why we did that story. Hey. And I won't be able to disabuse you of your notions. Yeah, no. I was, I, I was thrilled. When, this, when you get further signals, let me know. No. <laughs> I was thrilled that you guys did that story. But when I, and, and when I called the London office of the New York Times to say, can I speak to some of the reporters who worked on this British story, they said, oh, no, they're all in New York. And I go, why are they in New York to do a, a story on a British story that's been going on for years? It's sort of, we, it, we, it looked we a little odd to me. We keep, them on, we keep them on chains and just throw red meat in there every once in a while. And then when the order comes, we say, unleash the hounds. And off they go to kill whatever we want. They were quality hounds. They did good work. First Amendment? There's no First Amendment here. It's a completely different environment. Hey. The whole thing couldn't have happened hey. in the States. Hey, everyone's... The yeah. Um, it's a lot yeah. the capital of the world here. <laughs> they're not out from under UK libel laws because they're, they're, they're making phone calls from New York. If they sell a single, if they sell a single they newspaper here, they're still, the sub, they're still subject to UK libel laws. So that's a non-starter. No, I'll be in the bar afterwards if you guys want to carry on uh, with my allegedly conspiracy theory. I don't know. Where you know what? I got to be fair. That is a reading of the situation. I don't agree with it. Yeah. And the optics might lead one to believe. I don't uh, share uh, your opinion. Yeah. I just uh, make fun of you because I love. Yeah. <laughs> where did you fly in from today? Um, Aviles, Spain, which okay. is, is... I was, yeah, because I was thinking EasyJet doesn't come from New York. I didn't know how uh, lagged you were. I don't know if you're going to be downstairs having a drink, but I'll be down there if you want to Well, I, speak I, w I will be downstairs. I will not be drinking. If you see me get into the drinking, you should call the cops. <laughs> uh, That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> the film is page one. It's being screened in cinemas here starting uh, September 23rd. You'll be working the red carpet, presumably? I'm, uh, I'm working on my outfit right now, so if anybody knows any good designers locally, you let me know. Otherwise, look it up. It's an interesting read. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs>